So I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Michael Jerison. Um, he's going to be giving a talk, uh, The Frog and the Snake, um, Buddhism and Violence. Um, Dr. Jerison is a specialist uh, in religion and violence, uh, in particular uh, with uh, the intersection between violence and Buddhism. Uh, he is assistant professor uh, at Eckerd College in southern Florida. Uh, he got interested in this research uh, through volunteering for the Peace Corps, uh, which was in Mongolia, uh, and that inspired him to uh, go into this kind of research and understand more about the intersections between violence uh, and religion, um, and particularly within the Buddhist context. Uh, he is uh, the so solo author of two books. Um, one is Mongolian Buddhism, uh, Rise and the Fall of the Sangha, and the second one is uh, Buddhist Fury, uh, religion and Violence in Southern Thailand, uh, which looks at the current insurgency that's going on in Thailand. Uh, he's also uh, co-editor of, uh, with, uh, uh, for two books. One is uh, Man, uh, Buddhist Warfare, which looks at over 1,600 years of Buddhist-inspired wars uh, that have taken place in Asia, East Asia, South Asia. Um, and then he's also co-editor uh, for the Oxford Handbook of Religion and Violence. Um, He's done most of his field work uh, in Thailand and in Mongolia. And he's currently researching uh, the relationship between religion and trauma uh, for Muslims and Buddhists who are living in conflict areas or conflict zones. Um, and I would say that his work uh, and what you're going to hear about tonight is quite relevant to a lot of contemporary and current events that are happening in the world. Uh, think in terms of uh, Burma, uh, Sri Lanka, and Thailand, for example, um, as locuses of uh, the intersection of uh, Buddhism and violence. So I think uh, with that, I'll turn over the, the microphone to Michael and Dr. Jerson, and thank you. Thank you, Travis, very much for the introduction, and I'd like to thank the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies, and particularly Janet, for their help in getting me here. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with religious studies, the chore for religious studies is not to give theological justifications or to give evaluative claims. Uh, it's to, or prescriptions for that matter, but to describe, to look at the way in which religion operates on a social level. And that's what I usually do. I look at the way in which so religion uh, interacts with politics, society, history. Uh, and my goal is not to try to sway people towards one religion or another, but simply to explain the phenomenon as it's working out in the world. So I'd like, if you can, just briefly to look at the color on the screen here and take a deep breath in and out. I'm asking you this because what psychologists believe is that the color orange releases more serotonin in our brains that helps us become more calm and relaxed. Now it might just be a coincidence that there are a lot of robes of Buddhist monks that happen to be similar colors. Saffron. Uh, although Buddhist monks' robes can range from light orange all the way to black, depending on what tradition they're from, Japan, uh, Thailand, Sri Lanka, you name it. But is it a coincidence that the color orange seems to release more serotonin in our brains to relax us, and that the colors of the robes are usually associated, I would argue, with peace? Buddhism, I would say, is usually associated with peace, whereas other religions are often associated with violence. Uh, and for Buddhism in particular, I would say that it operates both ends of the spectrum. In fact, we can look at just the saffron robes as an indication of this. Uh, there was the saffron army in 2007 in, in Myanmar. The saffron army was a beautiful display of civil disobedience, peacemaking, a, 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 a Ghani met method of, of uh, protest against economic sanctions in which the Buddhist monks went out and refudiated uh, the junta at the time, turning around their, their balls, their alms, to prevent the government from making merits, and riled the country up into a protest, almost creating a, a, a civil war in a peaceful way. At the same time, you have in Sri Lanka a different type of saffron army. Um, well, this was a saffron revolution, this was a saffron army, in which people like the JVP, Janata Vimukta Paramuna, uh, had monks in them that were involved in issues like assassinations of politicians, attacking people in protest, uh, engaging in violence while wearing the saffron robes. Uh, in many ways, the saffron robes displays the ambivalence that we see in Buddhist traditions for whether it's going to be for peacemaking or peaceful endeavors or for violent measures. 
Now, how did I get involved with this? Uh, I didn't decide to go, I'm going to look at violence. <laughs> violence actually is not a very healthy thing to look at too long. It gives you bad nightmares. It gives you ulcers. Um, I initially wanted to look at things that were uplifting, that were helpful, like activism. Uh, so I looked at Buddhist monks that ordained trees uh, to fight against big business because big, uh, people did not want to cut down the trees for the big business because you ordained the trees. And so it was a form of environmentalism that was Buddhist inclined. And I interviewed and talked with and become good friends with Dhammarana Bhikkhuni, who was the first ever fully ordained Buddhist nun in, in Thailand. Thailand had never had an ordained nun before in their entire history. She was the first one ordained in 2003 and has been working on gender activism, gender equality, through Buddhism. Now, in my efforts to look at this, I ran into some problems because my notions of activism in Thailand didn't seem to correspond with the way in which Thais thought about activism. I mean, in the United States, we think of environmentalism and gender equality as something that would fit with, with activism. But the term activism wasn't in the Thai language. There wasn't a direct translation. And so when I began to ask some questions about gender equality and environmentalism, I didn't get the same amount of sentiments as I would get, or like to think that we'd get here. I didn't know what to do. But suddenly, I had an issue that I thought I could talk about. Violence. Um, peacemaking. Because, of course, when Thais think peacemaking in the same way, they value peacemaking in the same manner that we do here. And a civil war broke out in the south of Thailand in 2004. And so I went there to see what peacemaking was involved. But instead of seeing the peacemaking, I saw monks involved in the warfare or supporting the warfare, but not involved in the peacemaking. And that made me begin to wonder. I'm like, this doesn't make sense. Buddhists aren't into violence. It's, it's oxymoronic. Buddhism is about peace. It's about meditation. And I decided to go back and do more research on it to figure out if I could, understand what was happening in Southern Thailand. How can I make sense of this? And I began to look at different wonderful discourses on religion and violence. And there's, there's quite a bit. Uh, and there's great books on the subject um, that will look at different ways to understand violence in the name of Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Violent Origins, fabulous uh, edited volume with Walter Burkert, Rene Girard, Jay-Z Smith, Great theorists looking at religion violence. But with all these books, they didn't talk at all about Buddhism. They excluded it. Uh, look, here's this wonderful one on religion and violence. The entire physical, philosophical perspective is from Kant to Derrida. But it had nothing to do with Asian religion. Charles Kimball um, writes, writes a great book, too, uh, When Religion Becomes Lethal. But he's looking at Judaism, Christian, Islam. So I couldn't figure out the Southern Thai context from these works. So then I said, okay, well, they, they don't have it here. Maybe they're missing out. Maybe the Buddhist studies people have some information. So I began to look at those books. And there's some wonderful introductory books to Buddhism for people who have no uh, prior understanding about Buddhism. And this talks about histories and practices, the cultures, argues that it's giving you the whole, you know, introduces you to the whole dimension of Buddhism. But in all these books, there was no discussion about violence. There's a lot of discussion about peace, how Buddhism is peaceful, but nothing about violence. In fact, uh, just to make this point more explicit, uh, there is the Buddhist encyclopedia that has over a thousand pages. It's two volumes, in fact. It has sections about Buddhist hells, ethics, iconography. It has 20 excerpts on nonviolence. Nothing on violence. And I would say there's a ramification of leaving Buddhism out of the discourse when it comes to religion and violence. For example, if you want to understand religion and violence as a phenomenon, you have to look at all religions. I mean, if you're only looking at the Abrahamic ones, then you're not understanding the relationship between religion and violence. You're understanding the relationship between Abrahamic religions and violence. And so, Bringing Buddhism, Hinduism, Jainism into the picture would be important to understand holistically how religion operates in relation to violence. But also, I'd argue that if you want to offer an accurate portrayal of Buddhist lives, Buddhist people, and their history, you'll need to talk about the less pleasant parts of that history. 
and if you leave out parts of the puzzle, it creates false associations or problematic ones. Take for instance, um, let's consider suicide attacks. I think this is a great example of this. Who do we associate with these, these actions? Or a better question, which religion do we associate with this type of action? Muslims, I heard Islam. It's like whispering, right? Islam. That's what we do. I mean, you, you, we've done a lot of surveys looking at and this is what people assume. They associate Islam with suicide attacks. And in recent years, you actually have had more suicide attacks done uh, in Islamic-inspired and related conflicts, although prior to 2009, that wasn't the case. Now, what's interesting is that no one will think about the genesis of contemporary suicide attacks, which are not Islamic-related the kamikazes of World War II, the Japanese. God's Wind, that was both a Shinto and Buddhist-inspired methods of devoting your life, sacrificing your life for a cause. And it was these actions that inspired the Japanese Red Army. This was a militant socialist group uh, that was Japanese that began to practice suicide attacks. And in fact, it was the Japanese Red Army on May 30th, 1972. Kozo Okamoto and two Red Army gunmen, on behalf of the Lebanese, they engaged in the first contemporary suicide attack in the Middle East at the uh, Lod Airport in Tel Aviv, Israel. Now, if you leave Buddhism out of the picture, I would argue you're leaving out a big piece of the puzzle about how suicide attacks have developed and spread around the world. Now, I have two goals, I guess, tonight that I'd like to uh, meet for you. The first of these is to explain Buddhist methods of justifying violence. How do Buddhists justify it? Now, I'm not going to try to justify it, but I'm going to show you how they have or scripturally have done this. And second, to offer evidence of Buddhist-inspired violence. So not simply talking about it or writing about it, but actually engaging in it. And in doing so, I want to be very clear, I'm not trying to say that Buddhists are violent people. I'm saying that people are violent. And some of these people happen to be Buddhists. Now, for talking about scriptural evidence that allows for justifying violence, I think it's helpful to look at the works of Carl Schmitt. He was a German jurist, a 20th century German jurist, who looked at the power of exceptions for governments. He said the power of government didn't lie actually in the laws, but lay in the exceptions for those laws. Or a state of emergency that would happen. I'm sure in the United States we know nothing about the state of emergency or creation of special laws like, I don't know, Patriot Acts that take place. His argument was just that in a state of emergency, a state of exception, certain laws could be passed that otherwise could not be. He said this is laid, this is where the most power of the state came, is with the power of exceptions. And I think his insight is helpful in looking at religion, because religions have codes. They have interdictions, what, when, what to do, what not to do, but they also have exceptions to those rules as well. Now, in the Buddhist case, the whole discussion of ethics is found not within lay practices, what people do, but within what monks do. Because monks are supposed to be the models of what other people are supposed to, to do. So looking at the, the, what's called the Vinaya, the monastic guidelines, I've found three different themes of exceptions to the rule when it comes to violence. The first of these themes is the stature of the person who commits the violence. I mean, there's certain allowances based upon what position you have in society. If you're a king, well, you're a king, you need to deal with corporal punishment or capital punishment. You need to torture in some ways. Uh, and then there's lots of things um, like in the Diga Nikaya, talking about how the king must punish people. Otherwise, if you don't punish, you're going to allow and enable more people to break the rules. And there's discussions about butchers. You know, butchers, they have to kill animals. And of course, they'll serve a lot of penance for this with lots of times in hell. But they're butchers. They have to kill the, the, the meat. They have to kill the animals for the meat. And there's also discussions about soldiers. And soldiers, of course, are going to be in a context that requires killing. Now, in the Samyutta Nikaya, the Buddha explains that when a mercenary dies with debased thoughts, that's important, debased thoughts, 
of slaughtering and killing other people, he is reborn in either the hell or the animal realms. It's not a good thing to be in the animal realms. So you're going down that way, according to Buddhism. Soldiers are thus cautioned to avoid the base thoughts at the time of death and at the time of killing other people. But not to avoid the act of killing. It wasn't the act of killing. This is where the exception comes in. As long as you don't have to base thoughts while you're doing the killing, it's okay as a soldier. And this gets to the second theme I found, which is the notion of intentionality. I mean, is it deliberate or accidental, the violence, for example? And there's just these very rich examples in the Vinaya for the monastic guidelines talking about distinctions about accidental and deliberate acts. Uh, in one case, uh, they go into great detail about a father and son who have joined the Sangha, uh, joined the monkhood. And in the, in the first case, in one particular case, Let's, the son accidentally pushes his father, who happens to trip, fall, break his neck, and dies. Now, in this case, because it was accidental, this would yield no offense for the son. The intention was not to cause any harm. It was accidental. He tripped. He pushed his father by accident. His father tripped, fell, broke his neck. Accidental. Now, the failed attempt to kill one's father so let's say the son wanted to kill the father, pushed him, he tripped, fell, and just broke his ankle. This results in a grave offense because he had a bad intention. However, the intention wasn't matched with the act. So he's not expelled from the Sangha. He's not expelled from being a monk. But it's a grave offense. He has to do a, com do a confession and serve a sort of penance for this. It's only when the death is caused by the deliberate intentions to kill that the son is told that he must lead the Sangha. So the intention must be there, coupled with the action itself in order for it to be a truly bad act. Now the third theme I found was the stature of the victim. I mean, it depends in the Buddhist scriptures about what thing is being killed. If it's an animal, I mean, there's lots of discussions in the, the Vinaya talking about crows, as one monk was killing lots of crows. Not a good thing. Don't kill crows. But it's, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a slight offense. You do a confession, you get over it. Uh, supernatural beings. You don't kill supernatural beings like yakshasas. Yakshasas are like these ferocious dryads in South Asia. You don't kill one of those, but you know, if you kill one of those, that's a grave offense. It's worse than killing a crow, but you're not kicked out of the sangha. It's, and here you find these exceptions if they're going to be animals. Or, or supernatural, as long as it's not human. So human is different. If you're killing a human, that's much worse than killing an animal or a supernatural being. Now, the Indian scholar monk, Buddha Gosa, in the 5th century CE, analyzed the monastic laws on murder in his Sumagala Velasini and claimed this. And I usually don't put a lot of stuff on it, but this is a primary source. He says, in the case of living creatures without moral virtues, such as animals, the act of killing is less blameworthy when the creature has a small body and more blameworthy when the being has a large body. Why? Because the greater effort required in killing a being with a large body. And even when the effort is the same, the killing of a large body creature is still more blameworthy because of its greater physical substance. In the case of beings that possess moral virtues, such as human beings, the act of killing is less blameworthy when the being is of little virtue and more blameworthy when the being is of great virtue. But when the body and virtue of creatures are equal, the act of killing is less blameworthy when the defilements and force of the effort are mild and more blameworthy when they are powerful. Now this quote here offers us a couple insights. And by the way, Buddha Gosa didn't underline this, I did it. Um, the first is that in Buddha Gosa's writing within the Theravada tradition, of, which is practiced in South Asia, um, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, and explains why there you're not going to be able to find beef a lot. The idea is you don't want to kill big animals. You kill small ones. You, they eat a lot of shrimp, fish, pigs okay, chicken, but you don't eat beef uh, because of the ideas about small versus large animals. But the other thing is the exception being made about the virtues. Someone with less virtue is less blameworthy. Because the reason he's saying why humans are more blameworthy to kill is because they have great virtue but you can find some humans with less virtue than others. 
So obviously, for one example, if you kill the Buddha, or a person who will be the Buddha, that's one of the greatest offenses you can do because of all the great virtue for that person. But for a person with not a lot of virtue, it's less blameworthy. This is playing on the exception. And this gets to the notion in a different Buddhist tradition, uh, the Mahayana tradition, of what's known as the Ichantika. Now, this is a very disputed um, term within the Chinese, uh, Korean, Taiwanese traditions. Nonetheless, it exists. Um, the Ichantikas are considered to be the reviled uh, people of the earth. They're unable to reach, as we call it, enlightenment. It just doesn't work. You can think of it almost as if, if the, the, the machine is just not working, it can't be corrected, it will never work. So the Ichantika is considered to be a, a lost cause. You can't work with the Ichantika, they'll never be able to become awakened, um, and they're considered to be a very little virtue because of it. Now, in the Chinese version of the Mahayana Mahaparinirvana Sutra, it is considered more harmful to kill an ant than an Ichantika. Within this text, the Buddha explains that no negative karma, so no negative actions will accrue from killing them. He says, just as no sinful karma will be engendered when one digs the ground, mows grass, fells trees, cuts corpses into pieces and scolds and whips them, the same is true when one kills an Ichantika, for which deed also no sinful karma will arise. Here, a perfect illustration of a human with no virtue that has an exception to it. But the question is, though, who gets to determine who's an Ichantika? Where is the authority for that? How do we measure that? And in these scriptures, again, I'm not saying that what I'm trying to point out here is that they provide exceptions to the rule that can be used and drawn upon. Now, these principles you find embedded within mytho histories. Uh, mytho histories being narratives that uh, aren't necessarily, we could find archaeologically derived, but nonetheless are largely believed by the people of the area. For example, the Mahavamsa in Sri Lanka. Now, the Mahavamsa, Maha is great. Vamsa literally means branch. It is considered to be the early genesis of what would become the Sri Lankan people, the Sinhalese Buddhists. And in this history, it talks about the righteous Buddhist king, Dutagamani, who fights a war against these heathens, the Tamil, the Tamils and the King Alara. And these are Tamils with a D, by the way. And so in this fighting, in order to capture the island and make Buddhism, defend Buddhism, Dutagamani affixes a, spear, uh, a Buddhist relic to his spear. And along with parasol bearers, aka monks, he charges in the battle and massacres hundreds of people, said thousands of people at the end. And upon finishing, he's feeling remorseful. This isn't a good thing, all this bloodshed. And he's visited by eight awakened monks, eight arhats, who speak to him thus. From this deed arises no hindrance in thy way to heaven. Only one and a half human beings have been slain here by thee, O Lord of men. The one had come unto the three refuges. The other had taken unto himself the five precepts. Unbelievers and men of evil life were the rest, not more to be esteemed than beasts. But as for thee, that will bring glory to the doctrine of the Buddha in manifold ways. Therefore, cast away from thy heart, O ruler of men. And so a couple of things I want to clarify here. One is the idea of the three refuges. Um, in Sri Lanka, in a lot of Buddhist cases, the idea is that by seeking refuge in the Buddha, uh, the Sangha, the monks, and the Dharma, the teachings, it's an indicator of being Buddhist. So he's saying, one person took the three refuges. One person was a Buddhist. And the other one took on five precepts, the, the Panchashila. Uh, no killing, no stealing, no lying, no taking of toxins to cloud the mind, and no sexual misconduct. So they were doing good things, but they weren't a Buddhist. So they were worth half a person. But everybody else, what was the language used? Were no more than beasts. They're animals. It's not the same thing as killing a human. Now, it might be just a coincidence that Tamil with a D sounds a lot like Tamil with a T.
But this mythal history was invoked and used by Buddhist monks for justifications in a recent civil war that took place in Sri Lanka. From 1983 to 2009, this was a civil war. It started on July 23rd, 1983, in what was called Black July, in which the liberation Tiger Thomas of Elam ambushed Sri Lankan military. 15 people were dead. The Sri Lankan government thought it would be best to do this quietly. They knew tensions were very great in the area. They didn't want to make a public display of their funeral, so they, they buried them in secret and did the rites in secret. But by doing it secretly, rumors began to spread. What happened? Why is the government being so quiet? And people began to think that something larger was happening. And this led the next day, for the next three days, riots throughout the country. 3,000 Tamils died from this. 10,000 homes were destroyed. There was a massive Tamil exodus. All during a time of which monks and the government began to cite the Mahavamsa. These are Tamils, just like the D Tamils before, that must be rooted out. The president, Chandrika Kumaratunga, talked about the fact that they needed to use violence as a last resort. She said, of course, we'd like to handle things peacefully, but we'll unfortunately have to deal with war as a last resort. And in 1997, the monk Piyadasi, a very prominent monk, explained it as thus. He said, you have to defend yourself. These are difficult questions. If someone goes to kill my mother, I'm going to stop him. So this could be a condition in which I am forced to kill. And I think his point is well taken. I mean, if someone's trying to kill your mother, how many people would not try to stop that person? Most of us, I think, would. And if stopping that person would require inadvertently or having to kill that person, I would still argue that most of us would be doing this. What Piedasi, though, is saying is that his mother is not just simply his physical mother, but the bearer of true Buddhism, Sri Lanka that should not be torn apart and separated by the, the, the tall tigers. <clears throat> now, Buddhist scriptures are very carefully to distinguish the difference between aggressive and defensive acts. During the Buddhist time, he had two primary support networks in the kingdoms of Magadha and Kosala. And at one point, those two kingdoms went to war. And he had to be very delicate in talking about what was right and wrong. And what he said was the fact that the kingdom that was on defensive was in the right more than the kingdom that was on the aggressive. And so this is what they saw here. They saw it is for Sri Lanka that they were on the defense. They're defending this little teardrop of an island, this last vestige of true Buddhism in the world from being separated, from being destroyed by these separatists. While Paul Rahula is author of important books on Buddhism in the United States, such as What the Buddha Taught, Heritage of the Buddha, he taught at the University of Chicago. He was the first Buddhist monk to hold a professorship in the United States. And he argued that the Sangha is ready to lay down their lives to prevent the government from negotiating with the Tamil insurgents. He didn't want them to negotiate. Forget about peacemaking negotiations, didn't want that at all. He told the Sri Lankan president to deal with the LTTE that he must militar militarily eradicate terrorism. There's another principle that I think is important to visit in Buddhism. The notion of upaya. Upaya is more prevalent, you'll find, within uh, the Mahayana and Vajrayana traditions of Buddhism that will be Tibet, Mongolia, China, Korea, uh, Vietnam. Upaya means skill or skillful means or skill and means. And there is a story, the Upaya Kaushala Sutra, uh, which chronicles a former birth of the Buddha. Now, former stories of the B Buddha's former lives are used oftentimes didactically to instruct Buddhists about morality and ethics because here is the former Buddha. He's doing something right in these lifetimes to eventually become the Buddha. So they talk about these stories in a way to impart uh, correct ways of behaving. And in this story of the Upaya Kaushala Sutra, it talks about a captain named Mahakarunika, which literally means the captain of great compassion. And the captain of great compassion is out at sea with 500 people aboard. 
And one night he goes to sleep and he's visited by water deities who tell him that there is a person on board the ship that's going to kill every single person on the ship, including the captain. And what makes this such an awful thing is that the captain is eventually going to become the Buddha. So this is a very bad thing to do. And in fact, all 500 people are going to be future bodhisattvas. So the sin that this person is going to be going to commit is so innumerous and so awful that it must be stopped. Now, Captain Maha Karunika, Captain of Great Compassion, thinks about this, tries to think of what to do. And in the sutra, he says thus, There is no means to prevent this man from slaying the merchants and going to the great hells, but to kill him. And he thought, if I were to report this to the merchants, they would kill and slay him with angry thoughts and all go to the great hells themselves. Remember the idea of the base thoughts. They would go with angry thoughts and they would, be, they would suffer. And so he thought, if I were to kill this person, I would likewise burn the great hells for 100,000 eons because of it. Yet I can bear to experience the pains of the great hells that this person not slay these 500 merchants and develop so much evil karma. I will kill this person myself. And so here, he's, this is an example of compassionate violence. He's killing this person to save him from all this negative karma that he will accrue. And the Buddha explains that the 100,000 eons are actually excused from him because he had good intentions and he used upaya, skill and means. Now, I'd like to take a, a look at a historical event that took place. Uh, for example, the Russo-Japanese War. This was during a time period for Japan where they were pushing, uh, Japanese were pushing Buddhists and Shintos to support the state, to support the emperor. In fact, uh, very quickly, Shintoism was affixed to state uh, national interests. And there were some Buddhist resistance, and it was quickly eradicated. So Buddhists became all pretty much unitarily in support of the emperor and his, and his efforts and began to advocate for imperialism and war. Most importantly, we found this within the famous U.S.-Japanese Buddhist scholars D.T. Suzuki and his Renzai mentor, Soen Chaku. Now, Suzuki has offered some of the earliest and most popular books on Buddhism in the United States. So if you've read Buddhism, it's probably been influenced by D.T. Suzuki. He's written an introduction to Zen Buddhism, which has a foreword by Carl Jung, uh, and outlines of Mahayana Buddhism. And Suzuki, talking about the Russo-Japanese War, and World War II, I might add, said that religions need to support unconditionally Japan's efforts to punish heathen countries. These heathen countries being, for example, Russia, Russia China, heathen countries. His mentor, the Renzai master, Soen says, in the present hostilities into which Japan has entered with great reluctance, she pursues no egotistical purposes, but seeks the subjugation of evils hostile to civilization, peace, and enlightenment. Right? She's only opposing those who are trying to eradicate peace. They're standing as obstacles in the way of enlightenment. That's all that Japan is doing. There were Pure Land, Shin Buddhist responses, also like uh, Osuga Shudo, who said that reciting the name of Amita Buddha, makes it possible to march onto the battlefield in the firm belief that death will bring rebirth in paradise. Being prepared for death, one can fight strenuously, knowing that it is a just fight, a fight employing the compassionate mind of the Buddha, the fight of a loyal subject. And here you have Pure Land views of war. If you die, Pure Land awaits you. Now we can also consider, if we can, the answer that So and Shaku gives to Leo Tolstoy. Leo Tolstoy writes to, to Shaku, asking him to help him out with negotiating peace between the Russians and the Japanese. And Shaku responds, even though the Buddha forbade the taking of life, he also taught that until all sentient beings are united together to the exercise of infinite compassion, there will never be peace. Therefore, as a means of bringing into harmony those things which are incompatible, killing and war are necessary. It's compassionate violence. This gets the idea of shunyata, a principle in Mahayana and Vajrayana Buddhism, 
Shunyata means emptiness. And the rationale is this, that nothing truly exists in and of itself. There is no soul. There is no Atman. There is no permanent self. So when you're on the battlefield, you're killing, you're not killing anything really. Those people are actually empty of any true nature. But see, the problem is this. They're living in these heathen lands, like China, that has the incorrect Buddhism around them. So they won't be able to, to become enlightened in, in China. But what we can do is go in there, kill some people, they can then be reborn in China with the correct Buddhism there, and then they can become awakened. It's compassionate violence. It's also, again, employing the notion of shunyata, of emptiness, in a particular way. There was a Zen koan for Zen priests, actually, who marched in the battle. One of them was shoot, shoot, bang, bang. That contemplating that will lead you to enlightenment. There's also the notion of reciprocal, justified violence. Um, and this is, uh, comes, I think, most poignantly in another story of the Buddha, in which he's a blue-green frog. At one point, a snake falls into a trap, along with a whole bunch of fish in the water. And the fish begin to attack him, and he cries out to the frog. He says, please, frog, help me. This isn't fair. The fish are trying to attack me. To which the frog who is the Buddha-to-be, answers, if you eat fish when they get into you, your lair, the fish eat you when you get into theirs. And having pronounced this opinion, the, sis, the, the fish seize upon the snake's weakness and tear the snake apart. Here we see the Buddha condoning violence due to the context of reciprocity. Now, from these examples I'm giving, what we can get from this is that there is a notion of just war ideology within Buddhist traditions. Just war is not just an Abrahamic notion. In Sri Lanka, there was effort to preserve true Buddhism's heartland at all costs, even if the last resort was for peace was, was warfare. In Japan, the idea was to fight to preserve true Buddhism by eliminating anything that was obstacles to enlightenment and peace. And that last resort was imperialism and warfare. But what else do we learn from this? There is the common method of dehumanization that happens within any sort of rhetoric when it comes to violence. The first thing you need in order to feel more at ease with hurting somebody, killing somebody, is to see them as different than you, see them as less than human. And what do we have here? The Chantika is less than an ant. Sri Lanka, remember, only 1.5 people were killed. The rest were beasts. They're dehumanized because they're not Buddhists. They don't have Buddhist virtues. Or I think the most pronounced, the most pro profound way of dehumanization possible here is shunyata, right? They're empty. They're not even people. You're not killing anything. Now, getting back to my crux, the problem that I had in Thailand, when I found Buddhist monks involved with the violence, was this rare? I found that it wasn't. Here are some snapshots of examples of Buddhist monastic-inspired violence throughout the centuries. Um, for some reason, it's cut out a little bit, but in four, it's 402 to 626 CE in China. You had Buddhist-inspired revolts. These were messianic ones, believing that the Buddha-to-be Maitreya had come, and they needed to go out and kill Mara, the nemesis of the Buddha. You had soldier monk-led revolts in China. In Tibet, a lama, a Buddhist lama, took upon himself compassionate violence to kill the king who was no longer going to be supporting Buddhism. And to this day, Tibetans reenact this, this killing of the king in a dance, in a performance that they celebrate. Japan, you had warrior monks. Korea, you had monks fighting against Jurkin and Mongols. Uh, the warring state period in Japan, Laos, and in northeastern Thailand, you had holy man revolts in which people proclaimed themselves to be Buddhas saying that Maitreya was here and leading revolts. Um, the Zen monk soldiers in Russia Japanese war in Sri Lanka, we have the JVP monks killing politicians. And right now, the Badu Balasena, uh, which is a party that involves a lot of Sri Lankan Buddhist monks, are attacking Sri Lankan Muslims. Some examples about Buddhist monastically inspired violence. 
or where monks are involved with violence. But what do we make of this? Right? You can say, well, well, Michael, you're just depressing us. What's the point of talking about this, right? Um, I want to revisit, if we can, popular U.S. conceptions of Buddhism. Uh, when I Googled uh, Buddhism, I got some images up. And I would say these images reflect parts of Buddhism. You have the, the chakra, the wheel, it reflects the turning of the wheel, the, turning of the, the teaching of, of, of Buddhism. Uh, you've got um, Budai, you know, the, the happy Buddha, who's considered to be the future Maitreya in China. You've got Buddhist monks praying. You've got Siddhartha under a tree becoming awakened, the lotus flower, uh, becoming like the lotus flower. It's a, it's a metaphor for awakening. But these show part of the tradition, not the whole part, They're not the whole entirety. And the question is, are we exoticizing Buddhism by only showing one part of it? And you can say, well, so what? So, so what's wrong with just exoticizing? What's wrong with just looking at what's nice or what's peaceful or what's beneficial to us? And instead of me answering that, I'm going to let a few others answer that. Jamyang Norbu is a Tibetan political activist. He's the founder of the Tibetan Center for Advanced Studies in Dharmasala. And he said this. He said, in the West, the response to Tibetan culture is so worshipful and romantic. There are elements in Tibetan culture that have all this magical, medieval stuff that Westerners love. The New Age thing. The Tibetan thing has style, the color, the costumes. To a great extent, we exist only in the imagination of Western fanaticists. They're not real. It's just an imagination. Thupten Sering, a famous Tibetan filmmaker, director of award-winning film of Wind Horse about Tibetans living under Chinese suppression, said this. He said, people assume that if you're a Tibetan, you're peaceful and polite and smiley. They are imposing this Shangri-La fantasy myth on Tibetans. They see Tibetans as cute, sweet, warm-hearted. I tell people, when you cut me, I bleed just like you. Here's the Tibetan activist who would like to be seen as real. In some ways, the dismissal of violence, if anything, robs people of their humanity. They're no longer seen as real anymore. Let's take, for instance, this image here. I like showing this because, for me, it creates a sense of cognitive dissonance. There's something wrong with seeing a monk with sunglasses on a motorcycle. Right, it doesn't seem to work. But why? What's, for me, I was thinking, what's wrong with, why does it not seem to work for me? And I realized that in the United States, what does the motorcycle symbolize? Virility, masculinity, power. Cover of my Buddhist warfare volume. People were really upset about this one, having a child holding a gun. Now, this was, by the way, in 1988. So when we published it in 2010, this child was 22 years older. So it wasn't like we were subjecting them to anything. But the same results, cognitive dissonance. What's, this doesn't make sense, looking at this child holding a gun. But what is it about a gun? Gun is power. Not a good way necessarily, but it is power. We see lots of images of children holding guns on religions, but for some reason, we don't like to see it with a Buddhist. We like to see children meditating on covers, but not to hold a gun. Both images show males with power, but they're removed from our popular conceptions. And perhaps this is a problem. So if I can return to the goals I've hopefully been able to attain tonight, you'll have to let me know on this. It was first to provide Buddhist methods of justifying violence. And I talked about, in the scriptural traditions, the states of exception, the ambiguity that could allow for excuses for violence, with the stature of the person committing the violence, the intentionality, or the stature of the victim. And then I hoped to show you evidence of Buddhist-inspired violence, such as the Sri Lankan Civil War, or the Japanese, Russo-Japanese War. Uh, 
and I want to, if I can, reiterate, I'm not trying to argue that Buddhists are violent. Again, just that people are violent. And some of them happen to be Buddhists. Thank you. Dr. Jerison, uh, please come up and go ahead and ask him a question. Any questions to start us off? And uh, let me just add to, because uh, I know some of you do have to leave. We do have a few of his books uh, here that are available, and we also have some order forms uh, for anyone who might be interested in ordering a couple of copies of these. Um, but for now, we have about 20 minutes for question and answers, uh, as uh, Dr. Brusick is pointing out. So if anybody would like to ask any question, uh, it would be a good time to come up over here to the microphone. Hi, um, I had a question. Um, I'm still not very versed in um, all the aspects of Buddhism, but um, I remember at the end of your slideshow, you showed um, those two pictures of um, the monk showing, uh, holding the gun and also the monk that was on the motorcycle. And um, uh, one question was, um, are Buddhists, aren't Buddhists supposed to like, not even own anything like a motorcycle or any type of car? Like, that kind of like invokes desire I and mean, not the whole enlightenment thing. And um, also, um, I guess like, so, they're, the violence that Buddhists have used, the justification is that um, they are like, oh, if I kill this person, it's for the good of all humanity. So um, I, there's no bad karma, it's actually good karma. And so, like, is there different definitions of what, is there like a universal Buddhist concept of uh, what is justification? And uh, yeah, that's it. Great questions. All right, so the first question was about the use of a motorcycle. Uh, Oftentimes when I teach religious studies, I argue that there's two facets to a religion. I think we usually ignore one of them. There is the idealized form of religion, and there's the lived form of religion. Um, give you, we bring it home a little bit. When I was teaching in Thailand to Buddhist monks, at one point one Buddhist monk raised his hand and said, Ajahn Michael, people don't lie or steal in the United States, right? And I was like, what do you, what do you mean? Go, well, you know, the Ten Commandments, right? All these things you're supposed to do. I'm like, okay, yeah, th those are like guidelines. Uh, those are things that people try to do. And in fact, that would be an example of idealized religion. But for example, I'm in Florida, and Paul Hill, who's a Presbyterian minister, went and decided that it was okay to kill abortion clinic doctors in Florida. He interpreted religion in a particular way. That's a form of live religion. And you see both of these happening in every religion. So yes, monks are supposed to forego most items of uh, acquisition. Uh, but you have in time, for example, monks riding around in Rolls, Rolls Royces at times. Um, some monks think it's okay to chew betel nuts and to smoke, and others think it's okay. So there's all these exceptions that are being made. Um, and with the monk there, we don't know if it's a novice or not. Novices can actually ride motorcycles, that we find. You're not restricted in this way. So that would be answering this, the, the first question, uh, is that one, uh, some things are interpreted differently, although they're not supposed to have and others, it could be, in fact, they could be a novice. Uh, but the second question about if there's a universal principle for violence, uh, this is something that is lacking within Buddhism. In fact, there's some scholars who argue that there isn't such thing as Buddhism. This is a, a Western imposition that we constructed this category and added the, the Greek suffix ism to it, when in fact there's all these different things going on. I don't, I don't agree with that response. Um, I don't think that we've, the Westerners have invented this. There are clear connections being made. Um, but it's not like there is a pope for Buddhism that oversees all of the Catholic Church. Um, there's no international Buddhist conference or workshop that brings all the traditions together to agree upon these things. And what we, what we find with looking at different Buddhist traditions, it's so varied. 
I mean, you have Newari Buddhists uh, making offerings to Hindu gods. You have Tibetans seeking four refugees instead of three, the guru. Uh, so when you're looking at universal principles, um, the universal principles I do see, which would include violence, for example, would be, for example, the punch of shield, the five precepts. No killing, no stealing, no lying, no taking of intoxicants that cloud the minds, no sexual misconduct. But again, the issue is not just the fact of no killing. This is similar to, by the way, the, the, the Ten Commandments. It's not thou shalt not kill, it's thou shalt not commit murder. That's the actual correct translation. And that gets to an issue of interpretation. It gets again to the issue of interpretation for killing. What is killing? What are you killing? And so although that, I think you're right, there is that universal idea that we can ascribe to all Buddhists. Uh, and by the way, Hindus have the same notions. For, they actually have ten, and five of them are the same. Um, nonetheless, there's a lot of ambiguity that allows for interpretations to provide those exceptions. Okay, question? Great. So, and you, you kind of got into it a little bit in the last answer, but uh, my question was, what constitutes little virtue and who actually decides that? That's an excellent question. Uh, what constitutes little virtue? I mean, it, with most texts, it talks. About, they always give examples. For example, of you know the, the most the exemplar is being of the most the Buddha. Uh, so it's said that if you cause the Buddha to bleed, you're going to Avicii hell, the worst of hells possible. Um, and so, how far removed are you from the Buddha? Uh, it depends upon the traditions. In Theravada, you're supposed to model your life based upon the life of the living Buddha. Um, but, and that would be one way in which they could gauge one's virtue. Um, we see within the Sri Lankan context, virtue is measured not only in taking those five, following those five precepts, which are considered to be virtuous, but also taking those three refuges as well and living to it. Uh, what is virtuous but, but uh, honoring the Buddha, seeking refuge in the Buddha, the monks, and, uh, and the, the, the teachings of the, of the Dharma? Um, so it varies, but your, your question also points to the issue of who has the authority to, to decide upon this. And this shows the power involved in someone declaring this. Um, for example, in the 1970s, uh, a Thai, prominent Thai Buddhist monk, Kitty Wuto, was very upset about what was happening around Thailand uh, because you had the Khmer Rouge that was, by the way, initially supported by Buddhist monks, but then they turned against the Buddhist monks and there was this massacre uh, the, uh, the genocide taking place of the Cambodians right next to Thailand. Laos was turning into socials. In Vietnam, what was going on? And so they were very concerned about the communist movement in Thailand, to which Kitty Wutu said, urged people that it would be, there would be no negative karma from killing these communists because they have no virtue. Now, what gave him the authority? Well, his authority there was the fact that he was a prominent monk. Uh, monks are seen in respect. That's one of the, one of the refuges, right? Is to seek refuge in the Sangha. I mean, for some Buddhist traditions, you can't really get to the Buddha. He's gone. You honor him, but you can actually interact with what he's left behind, which is his teachings and those who are following his teachings, the monks. And those become oftentimes, because the only ones who can speak are the monks, uh, the authority figures in that way. Great questions. Okay, we still have time for a couple more. If anyone has another question for Dr. Jerison. Uh, I actually had uh, one I wanted to ask you. You said at the end, uh, you showed us these two symbols of a Buddhist monk, again, uh, one with a gun, one on a motorcycle. You associated both of these objects with power. And you said that, uh, I think really you're talking about the Western perception here, we may experience a kind of cognitive dissonance, right, when we see the monk merged with the symbol of power. So what's the story behind that? Why would people uh, be interested in presenting monks in a way where we don't think power should be associated with them? That's a, that's a big question. I'll try to answer it um, in a short period of time. Part of this has to do with how Buddhism came to the United States. Uh, now, Buddhism first came with Chinese immigrants in the 1850s. They built our railroads and they set up the first Buddhist temple in California, I think around 1853. But the first time it was introduced to, to white people was in 1893, uh, the problem of rural religions at the, at the, at the Chicago Fair. And at that time, there was a lot of Protestants who were frustrated with their religion. 
they felt it was out of step with science. It was dogmatic, and so was the Catholic Church. And so they looked to Buddhism. They heard about Buddhism at, at this parliament, and they wanted to bring in, but they wanted to bring in only as a philosophy. They thought that bringing it in as a philosophy would be less obtrusive. It would fit better with people. In fact, they did ways to make Buddhism seem more in line with Christianity. There was images of the Buddha that were very much Christ-like in terms of the iconography to make it more palpable in the early 1900s. And so Buddhism was introduced this way. And it was principally Japanese at the time because it was uh, Soen Shaku and D.T. Suzuki who spoke at the, for Japanese Buddhism at that conference. Now, what happened was, uh, and that's why Zen became very powerful in the United States and why it's so well known to this day in the United States is Zen. What happened in the 1950s was very powerful too because this was when the Chinese took over Tibet. And there's no longer Tibet. I know we have a free Tibet movement, but there's no Tibet to free. It's now about human rights, which is a very important issue with Tibetans right now. Uh, and at the time, two things were, were happening, I would argue. One is that the 14th Dalai Lama first requested aid from other countries to fight the Chinese. He actually asked the CIA to help out and fight it, but wouldn't do. And he realized that part of the problem was the fact that Tibetan Buddhism was looked upon as the most primitive form of Buddhism around, the most backwards form of Buddhism in the world at the time. And so he had to raise the way in which the world saw Tibetan Buddhism. He had to engage in that way. And so he sought ways to make it seem peaceful um, and also scientific. Because he was trying to solicit help in that matter and also to raise the status of Tibetan Buddhism in that in the means. Likewise, at the time, with the Chinese invading, I think it triggered a sense of need and accomplishment with us in the United States. And this gets to a notion that our historian Eric Wolf once said about history, which I like a lot. He says that history is a moral success story. That's what history is. It's just so, you know, look at all these things we accomplished from Rome until now, and, all, and look how great we are now. And it's just, that's, that's what history is for people, and how they're always in the center of the map. And so in many ways, with the Tibetans, it provided a perfect opportunity for people in the United States to feel like they could be heroes and rescue the Tibetans. And if you look at movies or ways in which Tibetans are depicted, it's always about people, the white Westerners coming out to help them out. Uh, to support these wonderful monks who are simply peaceful. But we're never giving them agency. It's not like they're powerful, but they're needing our help. And so I think it, it hit the right tone for us to feel like we were, make us feel good and be a sense of accomplishment and being heroic in that way. In some ways, that's needed too. And also fits, at the time, the 14th Dalai Lama's needs to raise the respectability of his religion and tradition. Uh, but what happened, though, I would argue, and some others I will argue too, is that that tool that was being used effectively is no longer needed. And in fact, it's now becoming more harmful than it is helpful and should be discarded. Okay, thank you. If we have one more question, we have time for one more. Okay, one more for you, Dr. Jerison, please. I just, I was inter uh, interested. Um, it seems like we hear a lot about uh, Christian and uh, Muslim uh, extremist groups. Is there any like similarities between that and Buddhism? I mean, is there Buddhist extremists, or I mean, do any like does the United States government or any of its allies like recognize any religious fanatic or extremist groups that are Buddhist? Um, I mean, I know you talked about the one group that was killing Muslims, so I don't know if there's any anything uh, similar along those lines. It's a good question. I, mean, I think it's really helpful to look comparatively. So it's a, I, I appreciate that question. Um, Om Shinrikyo was a new religious movement in Japan, um, and Shoko Asahara drew upon the Lotus Sutra, Buddhism, and also other things like Christianity and Hinduism, and engage, engaged in a gas uh, bombing in Tokyo, killing lots of people. This was deemed to be a terrorist act. Um, people like to say it's not Buddhist at all, but I think part of it is the, our desire not to see the Buddhism in it. Um, but more recently, do the, we're starting to see a shift, I think, in the way in which the media is looking at things. The Rohingya right now in Myanmar are being, I don't know if you've been catching the news on this, but they're, they were stripped of citizenship over 10, 20 years ago. They're being, they're the most neglected minority, the most oppressed minority right now they're calling in the world, and it's partly because they're Muslims. 
and you have these monks that are called by the media fanatical monks that are drumming up the call for warfare and for violence against the Rohingya. Um, and so you begin to see people talking like the 969 movement in Myanmar is deemed as a fanatical Buddhist group. That's the media saying this. Uh, the Badu Balasena that I mentioned before, this is a, a group that's uh, talked about how halal in Sri Lanka was an attack on Buddhism. Get rid of the halal because it's, it's, it's an infringement. And they actually try to drum up attacks for Muslims and they've been called an extremist group. Uh, but I don't know they've hit our terrorist group listings for the U.S. government. That's a great thing to, to look into in that sense. Okay, I'd like to thank Dr. Jarrison one more for coming all the way from the great state of Florida, presenting a very interesting talk. Uh, we do have some light refreshments here to our left. Uh, Dr. Jarrison will be here if you'd like to talk to him, ask him a question. And again, he does have some of his uh, books for sale if you're interested in purchasing any of them. So thanks for coming. 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 So thanks for coming.